Harvard has a tradition of having German statesmen as its guests at commencement. Former Chancellor Konrad Adenauer in 1955, former Chancellor Helmut Schmidt in 1979, President of the Federal Republic Richard von Weizsäcker three years ago, and today Chancellor Helmut Kohl. This is actually Chancellor Kohl's second Harvard commencement. He attended last year's commencement to see his son Walter graduate with the class of 1989. Since the end of World War II, Germany and Berlin have continually been the focal point of the tension in East-West relations. At no time during that 45-year period has that been more true than today. When and how will Germany reunite? What will the relationship of a reunited Germany be with the other Western European states? What will the relationship of a reunited Germany be with the reconstituted East Bloc countries? What will the relationship of a reunited Germany be with the United States? Helmut Kohl was 14 years of age when World War II ended. He has spent his entire adult life pursuing German reunification and crafting the answers to the questions that reunification raises. His guiding principles have always been clear. At home, personal freedom and civil liberties. Abroad, a unified Germany in a democratic and peaceful Europe enjoying a special partnership relationship with the United States. Rarely in history has one man stood at such a series of crossroads. Free men everywhere have an interest in the direction he takes. President Kennedy, who, if he were alive today, would be here celebrating his 50th reunion with the class of 1940, dreamed dreamed in 1962 when he stood at the Berlin Wall and said, Ich bin ein Berliner. Then we shared President Kennedy's dream. Now we share Chancellor Kohl's reality. Today, we are all German. Herr Bundeschancellor, heute sind wir alle Deutsche. Uh, Charlie Egan's uh, become a multilinguist uh, today. Chancellor Cole stepping forward. His talk will be simultaneously uh, translated to German interpreter Edward Marsis. This will be a little complicated, but it will be interesting. The interpreter is sitting at a table uh, just off the side near Appleton Chapel, away from where uh, Chancellor Cole is. And now Chancellor Cole. President. Mr. President, Meine Damen und Herren, ladies and gentlemen, liebe und dear Studenten students Harvard of Harvard University, Vor einem Jahr a year ago habe ich schon already I attended an der the commencement exercises in Harvard. Damals On that occasion, mein Sohn my son Walter Graduation. was graduated here. Walter, hat mich gebeten, Walter has asked me to convey a message to you today. In his opinion, Mather House is the best house here in Harvard. <laughs> Mr. President, ladies and gentlemen, I deem it an honor to be able to address you here today. This site is of special symbolic significance for a German. 43 years ago, George Marshall delivered here his famous speech, initiating the reconstruction program for Europe. It was the American response to a momentous challenge 
generous and far-sighted. 35 years ago, Konrad Adenauer, the first chancellor of the Federal Republic of Germany, gave a speech here. A few weeks earlier, the three Western powers had revoked the occupation statute. The Federal Republic of Germany had acquired its sovereignty and become an equal partner in the community of free nations. Against this background, today's ceremony affords me a special opportunity to thank the American nation for everything that it has done for the benefit of Germany and Europe in the past years and decades. This is a time of joy, pride and gratitude. The vision of Germany's and Europe's freedom and unity is becoming reality. The dream of a free, peaceful and just world will materialize provided that we do not relax our common efforts. This dream is linked particularly closely to the ideals of the American nation. The people in Central, Eastern and Southeastern Europe rebelled against dictatorship with the words we are the people who was not reminded of the splendid introductory words to the American Constitution. We the people. In many countries, the people have smashed the chains of dictatorship, including my fellow countrymen in the GDR. The unification of Germany is now underway. It is a victory of the right to self-determination. This, this is a cause for joy, just as much for our American friends as for ourselves. The Americans, in particular, have always struggled against people being kept in tutelage by foreign powers. In fact, the ideal of self-determination is the true source of the American nation. For more than 40 years, the division of Europe was a major cause of the tensions in East-West relations. Overcoming this division thus serves the goal of peace. The unification of Germany will, in addition, impart a strong impetus to the process of European integration which will result, not least, in an economic upswing from which many will benefit. All in all, German unity will be a gain in human, political and economic terms, not only for us Germans, but also for our neighbors and friends. When George Marshall delivered his famous speech here at Harvard, Europe lay in ruins. It was on the verge of bleeding to, de to death from the consequences of the war 
unleashed by the Nazi tyranny. Left to its own devices, Europe was too weak to defend itself against Stalin's expansionary aspirations. Here in Harvard, George Marshall's speech initiated one of the great success stories. Today, we face another historic challenge. We must overcome the economic and ecological devastation and the moral crisis in Eastern Europe. We must firmly anchor democracy in a part of the world where dictatorship prevailed for decades, for over 57 years, in the case of my fellow countrymen in the GDR. 43 years ago, the primary objective was to send a signal for overcoming despair and hopelessness. Today, we are about to give effect to the grand vision which George Marshall, too, had in his time. At long last, the people and nations in Eastern Europe are to be able to live as we in Western Europe have been able to do for decades, above all, thanks to American assistance. By virtue of America's assistance, the Europeans are today in a position to perform a major part of the necessary reconstruction work through their own efforts. But for this too, we need continued partnership with our American friends. If Europe and America combine their intellectual and material resources for this task, they will invest in their common future. It is an investment whose yield will benefit all of us. This investment is therefore dictated not only by solidarity, but also by common sense. It is in our joint interest that flourishing regions should again emerge in Central, Eastern and Southeastern Europe and that freedom, democracy and human rights be established there too forever. I cordially ask our American friends to participate actively in this peace enterprise. In the past few weeks and months, the United States has responded to the changes in Europe and Germany with exemplary foresight. In the context of German-American partnership, close cooperation and friendship with President Bush mean a great deal to me. Above all, I rate highly the keen awareness of historic opportunities that has guided the U.S. government's actions. Friendship proves its worth, particularly in difficult times. My message today is this. German-American friendship is a decisive prerequisite for Europe and America managing to cope in unison with the tasks of the future. And I'm certain that if we cultivate and expand this friendship, we shall also be jointly successful. Europe will remain America's closest partner 
But the old continent will change its appearance. By the end of this century, the foundation stone will have been laid for a United States of Europe. I am firmly determined that this federation should not be an exclusive club confined to the present members of the European community. We are thus acting in the spirit of those great men and women who, after 1945, set about bringing together the people and nations of the free part of Europe. Vicariously for many, I would like to mention Winston Churchill and Konrad Adenauer, Robert Schumann and Jean Monnet, Alcide de Gasperi and Paul-Henri Spack, and not least eminent Americans like Harry S. Truman and James Burns. The overwhelming success and appeal of European unification have made a decisive contribution to the change of outlook in Central, Eastern and Southeastern Europe. The hopes of the people and nations there are based on what has been achieved in Western Europe. The United States of Europe must therefore be open to countries like Austria, Sweden, Norway, and Finland. It must not exclude the Poles, Czechs, and Slovaks, or Hungarians, or any other Europeans who want to join this federation. The United States of Europe will thus form the core of a peaceful order in which the nations of the old continent finally overcome former rivalry, chauvinist thinking, and mutual prejudice. The present-day relations between Germany and France set an example in this respect. Europe of the future will be a continent of diversity that affords the regions and nations new opportunities for self-development. This naturally includes, above all, the protection of ethnic, cultural and religious minorities. Europe of the future will be a continent of open borders. We Germans do not want to couple the unity of our fatherland with the displacement of existing borders. The The border between Germany and Poland remains inviolable. But in future, it should no longer separate Germans and Poles from one another. It, it must become open like the border between Germany and France. Without German-Polish friendship, it will not be possible to complete the development of a free Europe. Open borders also imply that Europe of the future must not seal itself off by protectionist measures.
Only free world trade generates prosperity. This is in the enlightened self-interest of everyone. And it would be a disservice to the partnership between Europe and America if, in the economic sphere, our relations were marked by unfair competition and short-sighted egoism, on whichever side. Despite different views on individual matters, Europe's and America's vital interests continue to be identical. We must therefore remain capable of jointly protecting our freedom. Although we are emerging from the shadow of the East-West conflict and are making progress in the field of disarmament, who can rule out risks in the future? Therefore, vigilance is the price of our common freedom, as NATO's motto points out. Precisely because it does not derive its raison d'etre from any hostile stereotyping, the Atlantic Alliance will remain in existence, though in a changed form and with an enlarged agenda. The political dimension of European-American partnership is now becoming even more prominent. In the period ahead, we must therefore intensify political coordination between Europe and America. If necessary, via new institutions. We have gained favorable experience in this respect within European political cooperation. We should use this experience to a greater extent for the transatlantic dialogue. It is more essential than ever for the Americans and Europeans to achieve the greatest convergence possible on important issues of foreign policy. This applies both to the aspects of East-West relations and to subjects that move up the agenda for the future. The Atlantic separates us only in a geographical sense. Even more than in the past, we now have the opportunity to devote our combined energies to new goals. Transatlantic relations are today denser than ever. America will continue to have a firm position in Europe. It has a triple anchorage there. Via the Atlantic Alliance, via increasing cooperation between the United States and the European community and via America's active role in the CSCE process. On the threshold to the 21st century, the agenda for the future contains many topics that we can only tackle in a full-scale effort by all free nations. The Europeans and Americans must together elucidate their vision of a better world in which coming generations can thrive. Let me name but one example that is particularly close to my heart, the protection of man's natural environment.
Together, we must strive for a world in which life in all its forms is respected. Creation was entrusted to mankind, and we bear responsibility for it. The destruction of tropical rainforests and the hole in the ozone layer over the Antarctic affect people in both America and Europe and on all other continents. The threat of global climatic changes impinges on the vital nerve of all nations without distinction. The growth of the world's population compels us to use non-renewable resources economically and to develop environmentally compatible sources of energy. We therefore need a worldwide partnership for the sake of the environment. The splendid and dramatic developments in Europe and Germany must not divert our attention from the problems of the third world. We must therefore, in the future, continue to frame a development policy which energetically supports the poorest and weakest and, above all, helps them to help themselves. This, too, is an investment in our common future. With this in mind, I proposed at past World Economic Summits, and for the first time at Toronto in 1988, that environmental protection be linked to debt problems. For instance, for instance, debt relief for third world countries should more often be made contingent on the funds released being used for tangible environmental measures wherever possible. The tremendous damage to the environment in Eastern Europe proves that economic and ecological considerations can be reconciled only in a free and open society. This is another reason why we must not relax our struggle for human rights and self-determination. In furthering the cause of freedom, encouraging success has been achieved in Europe or South and Central America. But in many parts of the world, people are still arbitrarily arrested, humiliated, tortured, or even murdered. They deserve our solidarity. And and we shall continue to do everything possible to assist them. Mr. President, ladies and gentlemen, finally, allow me to address a few words to the young men and women on both sides of the Atlantic. It is my generation's duty to leave behind a world in which you feel at ease, a world in which more freedom prevails, peace is more secure, and natural resources are conserved and protected more effectively. Soon, 
You will yourselves bear responsibility. But you will need partners. It is therefore essential that young Europeans and Americans get to know each other better right now. Across generations, a recognition must be maintained. Freedom imposes duties. And let me add here in Harvard that education also imposes duties. This applies particularly to the graduates of such an outstanding university as Harvard. To have studied here is a privilege, but such a privilege also implies special responsibility, that of placing your talents and knowledge at the service of your fellow human beings. At the end of a century, which has seen so much suffering and misery, today's young generation has a chance hardly any preceding one has ever had. The chance of a full life in peace and freedom. And the young generation has every reason to be optimistic in its pursuit of happiness. I wish all students here in Harvard and everywhere in Europe and in the United States happiness and uh, a life on which God has cast his blessing. Thank you.